And we begin with an overview of the material we're going to study in this session regarding the Old Testament. Last time we looked at the creation of all things, the creation week, the marriage of Adam and Eve, the fall of man, the martyrdom of Abel, uh, the genealogies in Genesis 5, and the birth of Noah. Now, this session, the universal flood and the sin of Noah and the Tower of Babel. We begin with the condemnation of all things. In Genesis 1 to 11, and you'll see in your notes, we divided this into four segments. Genesis 1 to 2, that's the creation of all things. Genesis 3 to 5, the corruption of all things. And uh, Genesis 6 to 9 or 10, the condemnation of all things in chapter 6. And it came to pass in the book of Genesis, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, <clears throat> for in that he is also flesh, yet his days <clears throat> shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and repented the Lord that he had made man in the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing in the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, <clears throat> Uh, there's been a lot of ink spilt uh, regarding these passages, these verses in chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. The key question is, who were those mysterious sons of God in Genesis chapter 6? Now, you have several possibilities, at least three. Number one, the sons of God were the believers. They were from the saved line of Adam. And uh, the daughters of men, they were the unsaved through the descendants of Cain. And so what you have here is an unholy alliance between saved people and unsaved people. Now, the second view says, no, that's not the case at all. In fact, the sons of God are not <clears throat> men at all, good or bad. These are angels. And the argument is when you find the words the phrase B'nai Elohim, the Old Testament, sons of God, it's always a reference to angels. And what these angels, these fallen angels did is some unthinkable, unimaginable, unspeakable way, found a way to have intimacy, physical intimacy with women. And these giants then were the offspring of uh, these sons of God. Now, let me just say that uh, I... I reject the first. I think there was not just Christians marrying non-Christians. I have a problem with the second, though, because of the law of biogenesis. I believe that, that life begets similar life, and I don't think you can cross a dog and a cat and get a dat, half dog and half cat. And I don't think you can uh, cross an angel with a human being and get a half angel, half uh, human being. There is a third view, though, and I hold this view, that the sons of God were indeed fallen angels. But what they did, <clears throat> they actually <clears throat> filled, they, they, what's the word I want, uh, they, they possessed all of humanity, with the exception of Noah and his wife, their three sons and their three wives. And uh, they did this, you have a demon-possessed race. And the reason being that uh, some believe they uh, wanted to so corrupt, uh, change the DNA in unborn babies as to prevent the birth of Christ centuries down the road because, of course, he was to be uh, the perfect uh, son of God, perfect humanity, and so they could do that by changing the DNA. Well, I think that's the view that I, that, that I would hold, and I think that's the correct view. But whatever the situation, we do know that God had determined <clears throat> to destroy the world. And he said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, one of the most thrilling verses in all the Bible, the judgment of God, the sins of men, 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. By the way, <clears throat> this is the first mention of grace in all the Bible. Some have said, well, the Old Testament is a story of law. The New Testament is a story of grace. That's totally wrong. The Bible is the story of the grace of God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then God told Noah <clears throat> to build a ship. And we want to ask some questions even before the <clears throat> we talk about the, uh, the flood itself. Some pre uh, ideas, uh, actually some, some pre-flood questions concerning the world uh, prior to the flood. Well, life prior to the Great Flood was doubtless very different uh, from today. And uh, we know that by, I think, uh, pieces uh, of information in the Bible and also geology has helped us. It was probably universally warm with a pleasant and mild climate. It may have had no deserts or ice caps. The land surface was more extensive and the oceans much smaller. And the topography itself was very, very gentle. A lush vegetation all over the earth, North Pole and South Pole. And it was totally different from what it is today. A second question, how advanced was the pre-flood civilization? Well, I want to tell you, they certainly weren't a bunch of cavemen running around grunting and and climbing trees and eating monkey meat. In fact is, and I wouldn't die for the accuracy of this, but it may be my own personal opinion that Neil Armstrong might not have been the first man to have landed on the moon. I mean, here the average age, we'll see this a little later, of people before the flood was 912 years old. Now, can you imagine the incredible uh, wisdom that might that that would have been gleamed in these nine centuries that would have passed on uh, to another generation. Albert Einstein, one of the most brilliant men of the last century, I think died in his early 80s. Let's suppose he could have lived 10 times longer than that. Can you imagine what he could have discovered and then passed on to his generation? So no, I think that uh, <clears throat> their civilization could have been, we don't know, could have been far more advanced than ours, but of course the flood came and wiped all that out. Uh, how did their age compare with our age? And our Lord says in Matthew or in Luke 17, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall also be in the days of the Son of Man. And I have in your notes here a number of uh, frightening comparisons between their age right before the flood came. And our age today in the 21st century, perhaps living right before the Lord Jesus will come. And you can, uh, you can look over those, that list yourself. All right, and then how could men live so long at that time? As I say, 912. <clears throat> how would you like to pay Social Security on those guys? Well, we don't know, of course, but uh, some believe, of course, sin had not fully settled down upon humanity. Sin is like a cancer. <clears throat> in fact, it's described in the scriptures, leprosy and cancer. And, uh, you know, you can have the seeds of cancer, even a small growth undetected of cancer in your body for 20, 30 years. And then finally, it, uh, it actually kills uh, the person. And so here, sin was introduced, I think, uh, to the human race, uh, each individual, maybe through the DNA, etc. So it may have taken uh, that long for sin to really, you know, uh, level it out, level out where we are now. The average age, is, as the Bible says, is three score and ten around 70. I think it's a little higher now for men and women <clears throat> in Western countries. Um, now, how much spiritual light did the pre-flood world have? Some have said, <clears throat> you know, Dr. Wilmington, I think uh, God is very unfair because uh, these men had never read John 3.16. <clears throat> They never heard a sermon preached by Billy Graham, and they had no printed Bibles back then. Well, they had a lot of spiritual light uh, regardless of that. They had the witness of nature, Paul says in Romans 1, and also the witness of their conscience in Romans 2. They had the promise of a Redeemer, uh, the first promise in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, God promised someday a baby born of a woman would crush the head of Satan. 
and they had the knowledge of the sacrifice. Abel offered a bloody sacrifice, a lamb, so they knew even before it was written in Leviticus, the the the, uh, the theological term there, without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So they had knowledge of the sacrifice, and they had the preaching of Noah. Simon Peter says that he preached uh, before the flood became, uh, before the came down, and then they had the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. But how sad to think that all this spiritual L-I-G-H-T would eventually result in spiritual L-I-F-E for only eight individuals. Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their three wives. Now, something concerning the ship itself. God warns him of a universal flood and orders him to construct a ship. It was to be a floating rectangular box made of cypress wood, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Now, that's if a cubit was 18 inches. Some believe that a cubit may have been at least two feet. If that's the case, then it would have been 600 feet long. And keep in mind that the Queen Mary, one of the largest ships ever built, was around 1,100 feet. So this is half the size, perhaps, of the largest, one of the largest vessels ever built. Now, God told then the eight of them to gather themselves in the ark. And then from the animal community, a male and a female, representing each species of unclean animals, bird and reptile, and seven males and seven females representing each species of clean animals and birds. Of course, the clean animals and birds were to be used for sacrificial purposes after the flood and also for food uh, regards to uh, these eight on board. Uh, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 7, the flood uh, actually begins. It's preparing for it in Genesis 6. And Genesis 7 opens up with these words, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. This is the first mention of, of the word come in the Bible. Do you know that there are <clears throat> almost 800,000 words in the Bible? Actually, 774,747. Almost 800,000. And do you know that the entire Bible could, in one sense of the word, theologically correctly be summarized with two words of these nearly 800,000. One directed to the lost, the other directed to the saved. To the lost, it's the word come. Come now, God says, and I will forgive you of your sin. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet as you be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come to this fountain, so rich and so sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. That's what the songwriter has written. So the first word is to the unsaved. Of course, in this case, Noah was saved, but he was going to be lost if he, he was outside. But then the second word is the word go. And that's to the saved person. We come into the ark of safety to uh, protect yourself against the storm of the wrath of God. But having been settled there, then God says, now that you're safe, go into all the world and teaching all nations, baptizing them for my name's sake. Come and go. Now, <clears throat> the flood lasted, and we'll see some questions about the flood a little later on, but it lasted approximately one year. And after, in Genesis chapter 8, the flood passes and the ark rests upon the mountains of Ararat. And Noah is told by God to be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. In other words, God is going to start all over now. He once uh, started with Adam and Eve. And uh, then now he's going to start with, I don't suppose, Noah and his wife, probably too old to bear children. 
But instead of uh, one couple, Adam and Eve, he now has three couples, uh, the sons of Adam, uh, the sons of Noah, and their wives. All right. <clears throat> they leave the ark, and then God said, I'm going to promise you a number of things, but one thing I will never, and your descendants, you can write this down, take it to the bank, I will never again destroy the world by way of the flood. And here is my covenant with you. This is my sign. This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be for a token of the covenant between me and the earth, and the bow in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. In other words, I will not again destroy the world by a flood. But... He did not say, I will never destroy the world again. To the contrary, in 2 Peter chapter 3, someday Peter predicts that this world and the very heavens surrounding the earth will be destroyed. Peter says, for the earth itself, the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the world be destroyed by a fire. The flood last time, the fire next time. And as God had prepared an ark to protect Noah in and from the flood the last time, so we have an ark shaped like the cross, the Lord Jesus himself, to protect us against the wrath of God that someday will destroy the earth and the heavens, and then, of course, create a new earth and a new heaven. Well, in one sense, it would be good if the account regarding Noah had ended there in chapter 9 of Genesis, verse 19. Noah is a hero now. He's uh, uh, 500, uh, 600 years old, and uh, he's uh, been a faithful follower of God, a man of God. He's walked with God. God has used him to save the entire world. However, someone has said that although the flood destroyed sin. It did not, I'm sorry, even though the flood destroyed sinners, and it did, except the eight of them, it did not destroy sin because you have sinners on board, all eight. These men are not perfect. Women are not perfect. You have a very, very sad situation in chapter 9, beginning in verse 20. Noah planted a vineyard, and it became drunk from its wine, and Ham and his son Canaan saw and may have caused the nakedness of Noah. And Shem and Japheth quickly cover their father's nakedness. Now, a couple of questions here. Uh, what was the horrible sin that promoted this curse? Now, let me tell you the story that Noah was drunk. And the Bible says that Ham and apparently his son, he had four sons. One of them was named Canaan, came into the tent and the scripture says, we're not absolutely sure what it means, uh, totally sure. And he uncovered his father's nakedness. Well, later on, the two other brothers, Shem and Japheth, came in. They saw this and they, they uh, covered him up. Noah then awakened from his wine. And the Bible says that he knew what his son had done. And then he pronounces a curse, not on Ham, but on Canaan. Now, if Ham was involved in this, why would he do this with Canaan? And some have translated this when he saw what his youngest one had done. In other words, uh, his youngest grandson. But regardless, uh, the, the, the curse is placed on Canaan. Now, uh, I'm sorry, the curse is placed on Canaan and his descendants. Now, uh, what was this sin? Again, we're not absolutely sure, but the phrase, the nakedness of his father, in chapter 9.22, is definitely connected with sexual immorality later on in a Leviticus 18 and 20. In other words, uh, there, uh, God invokes the death penalty. It says the father 
shall not uncover the nakedness of his daughter. That is, he is not to have intimacy with his daughter. Or the son is not to uncover the nakedness of his sister, uh, of, 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 his, of his mother. He is not to have physical intimacy with his mother, and uh, that led to the death penalty. So uh, I think that this may have been the first example of that horrible sin of homosexuality in the Bible. Well, let me just say this, though, that uh, one of the questions is uh, what was involved in Noah's threefold prophecy? Uh, negative, when he pronounced judgment on Canaan, it did not result in a special curse upon black people because Ham had four sons. And uh, this was, Canaan was the only one that actually went into the land of Canaan. What I'm trying to say is this, that I think he said that Canaan will be a servant of servants. He will, he will be a servant of Shem and Japheth. I think this had nothing to do, certainly, with uh, slavery that led to the fighting of the Civil War. Some preachers back then tried to say, well, this is, uh, you know, uh, a result of the curse. Uh, in Joshua 9, verse 27, we read, And Joshua, one of the descendants of Shem, made them, the Canaanites, the descendants of, Cain, uh, of Canaan, that day, hewers of wood and drawers of water. In other words, I think that was a prophecy that was fulfilled about 14 centuries B.C. Well, I have a lot of other questions, and I've got probably about uh, five minutes to finish this here. But uh, one, one of the things I want you to look at in your notes, how have the descendants of each of Noah's three sons contributed uh, to mankind. And this is a marvelous example of what uh, the Hamites and the Shemites and those from the tribes of Japheth have contributed to America, to Western civilization. All of them are absolutely indispensable, and you need to read my notes here. You have the creation of all things, Genesis 1 to 2, the corruption of all things, 3 to 5, and you have the condemnation thing, uh, condemnation of all things, 6 to 9, and then the confusion of all things in Genesis 10 and 11. And that's the Tower of Babel. And you can read what I have to say here regarding this temple of worship that God pronounced a curse upon. So you have creation, corruption, condemnation, and confusion, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, we need to look into uh, the second main division here. And uh, there's so many questions that uh, I've, I won't get into and discussing, but I'll just read a couple of them here. Uh, let's see here. When did the flood begin? What may have triggered the flood? Was the flood really worldwide? How destructive would a worldwide flood be? How big was Noah's Ark? How did he possibly get all the needed animals, etc.? You can read all that in the following pages right before our introduce, uh, introduction to Genesis chapter 12. One of the last ones, has the ark been sighted since it lasted, landed on Mount Arad? Okay, you have creation, corruption, condemnation, confusion. Genesis 1 to 11. Now, beginning in Genesis chapter 12, you have the life of Abraham. And I just have a few minutes, and there's no way that I can summarize all this. What I'll probably do is take a little more time this lecture, a little less time in the next 20, 25 minutes as we talk about the New Testament material that you're going to be presented with. You know, trying to do all this in 25 to 26 minutes is like trying to put a zebra in a 7-Up bottle. I'm not sure we'll get him all in. But in Genesis chapter 12 we have the life of one of the greatest men that ever lived, the life of Abraham. Think of it this way. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, God uses the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the spotlight. And I'm sorry, he uses the floodlight, and it just illuminates the whole stage, and he's blasting out like a shotgun, you know, nations and civilizations and the whole world. 
But beginning in Genesis 12, God lays down his shotgun, picks up a rifle. He lays down the, uh, uh, the floodlight, and he picks up a spotlight. And it zeroes in on one individual, Abraham and his son Isaac, and one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, and one of Jacob's 12 sons, uh, Joseph. So you have a number of C's here that we use in summarizing the life of Abraham. You have his conversion. And then in the land of Ur, the Chaldees, you have his call. You have his commission. He was to leave the land of Ur, the Chaldees, and make his way to the land of Canaan. You have his complacency. He gets bogged down on en route in the city of Haran, and he's there for a while till his father dies, and then he moves on into the land of Canaan, and God promises to give him. First of all, God says, I'll show you the land, and now God's going to give him all the land of Canaan. And then you have his carnality. In times of uh, famine, he leaves the land of Egypt, he leaves the land of Canaan, goes to the land of Egypt, and he's there for a while, and some tragic things happen, but God then eventually brings him back. And then you have number seven, the condescension of Abraham, how he acquiesces to the uh, demands of his young nephew, Lot. Uh, Number eight, you have the courage of Abraham, and you have the first battle mentioned in the Bible, and you can read about that. And then the communion of Abraham in Genesis 14, where he has communion with Melchizedek, who may have been Christ himself. And I have some uh, interesting facts about that. The covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, God, through a blood covenant, promises that he will bless the womb of Sarah, and then give Abraham and Sarah and the descendants the land forever. And finally, you have the compromise of Abraham, a sad chapter in chapter 16, where Abraham, uh, out of the will of God, marries a pagan girl by the name of Hagar. And finally, you have, in chapter 17, the circumcision of Abraham. And this will become, then, the not the source, faith of the source, this will become the sign of God's promise to Abraham.